in uh, Daniel chapter 4, and uh, a message that's uh, certainly uh, uh, a simple one, and that's the uh, insanity of pride. And uh, uh, it's, uh, boy, it's such an insidious thing, and it's, uh, it's one of those things that we know that can uh, uh, affect us, and certainly we live in a, a culture where uh, the values have, uh, have really uh, turned upside down in, in a generation. There was a time when if our athletes and political leaders and people on the news uh, exude humbleness, then we went, you know, right on. That's great. You know, we had applauded that. And, it, and if they exuded pride in any way, then that was seen as a, a negative thing. You know, oh, he's so prideful. Now it's flipped the other way. You know, uh, we, we, uh, we kind of extol those that exude pride and, quote, self-confidence and so forth. Uh, very interesting. There was a... Uh, uh, a recent study done by five psychologists interviewing college students, uh, they called this a narcissistic personality inventory, NPI. They uh, interviewed college students from 1982 to 2006, 16,475 college students, and, and, uh, and um, asked them uh, about statements, response statements, to, uh, like, uh, if I ruled the world, it would be a better place, you know. <laughs> True or false, you know, I think I'm a special person. I can live my life the way I want to and so forth. So they kind of had to look at these statements and rate them uh, in terms of how they felt about them for themselves. And um, one of the researchers uh, uh, said this uh, in the article, we need to stop the endless repeating your special and having children repeat that back. So the study leading author, Professor Gene Twinge of San Diego State University, kids are self-centered enough already. Uh, they also said uh, uh, about this whole narcissistic thing that we've been, in a sense, breeding our own kids, uh, that they are more likely to have romantic relationships that are short-lived, at risk for infidelity, lack emotional warmth, and, ex uh, and to exhibit game-playing, dishonesty, and over-controlling and violent behaviors. So that this idea that somehow self-esteem, making everybody feel good about themselves and so forth, is going to um, solve the problems of behavior in school and make be people better students and better people, it's actually produced the, uh, the opposite. Uh, the, and again, the researchers trace this phenomena back to the self-esteem movement that emerged in the 1980s. An example, twinge... Uh, Professor Twin cited the lyrics of a song commonly used uh, in preschool, sung to the tune of Frere Jaca. <laughs> it is a, I am special, I am special, look at me, look at me. <laughs> uh, current technology fuels the increase in narcissism, uh, Twinge added, by its very nature, MySpace encourages attention seeking, as does YouTube. So it goes on, look at me, I'm important, aren't I special? Uh, it's not producing such good things. It produces pride in a negative sense in individuals. We'll talk about pride a, a little bit, but uh, sometimes we use that term and say we're proud of someone and so forth and their accomplishments, and that's fine to be, you know, that you're, you're happy that somebody else has done well and, uh, and everything, but that's not the same as this self-centeredness that uh, is the concern here in our study. It's been said that pride is the only disease known to man that makes everyone sick except the person that has it. <laughs> I thought that was good. <laughs> and that's part of the problem. The prideful person it becomes self-deceit. We're looking at Nebuchadnezzar and, and his life, and God's been dealing with him, uh, and he's not really uh, done with him yet uh, in terms of breaking him of his pride. Uh, a couple of verses about pride. 1 Corinthians 4, 6, and 7 says, uh, Paul's saying, uh, Then you will not take pride in one man over another. That's our subject for who makes you different from anyone else. What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you, uh, you didn't? Uh, Paul's point is that we can be prideful in, in the things we have and our accomplishments and, uh, and, and so forth. Uh, well, yeah, well, if all that I've accomplished and everything, you know, I'm in the magazines now, you know, you see my name here and there. Yeah, but who gave you that a talent? Well, I guess the Lord did. Yeah, but it was my determination. I had to, who gave you the determination? Well, I think it was my, no, it was the Lord. I mean, Paul's point is, whatever you've got, man, if it's something good and you've accomplished something, great. Pray, praise the Lord for it. I, a little bit unrelated, but I read this thing this week that I thought was interesting. When the um, 
Astronauts first landed on the moon. You remember uh, there was the famous line, one small step for mankind, one giant step, or for man, one giant step for mankind. Well, that was going on, extolling man and his accomplishment. Buzz Aldrin was uh, inside this, the capsule having communion and saying, you are the, <laughs> again, you are the vine and I am the branches. You know, if a man remains in me and I in you, you know, uh, you'll bear much fruit. Apart from me, you could, he's quoting uh, John 15, 5 and busts out a little communion set he took with him and he's giving God the glory. So, uh, I'm not saying that the other one is a bad line or a bad quote, but there, there's, it, I think it leads to what we're, we're saying here. Uh, God is good and he's the one that, again, if he's brought things into our lives that we might be tempted to be proud over, actually we need to remember, as Paul says from this passage, and boy, this really applies to Nebuchadnezzar, that it's really from, from the Lord and he's the one that get, should get the glory for it. Paul also, Philippians 2.3, uh, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interest uh, of others. Don't do anything out of selfish ambition, vain conceit. In humility, consider others better uh, than yourselves. Uh, because of the culture that we live in, it's, even as Christians, it's, uh, it's very easy to get caught up in, in the whole thing. Do you, do, you really, do you ever consider yourselves better than someone else? I do. I do. <laughs> I have to catch myself all the time, especially if I'm in a retail store somewhere and the clerk's like 20 years younger than me and not exactly cooperative, like he's talking to his friend on the phone when he's supposed to be working. At that moment, I feel better than that person and I don't mind letting him tell it as a former manager. <laughs> uh, I don't, this is probably okay to call people's attention to the idea that they're getting paid for a living for what they're doing, but it's easy to look at someone else and think you're better than them because they, they have a lesser job or a lesser education or a lesser income or so forth. We need to be very careful. James 4.13 says, um, Now listen, you who say uh, today or tomorrow we will go to this city or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? Uh, you are a, a missed that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live or do this or that as it is. And here's again our tie-in. You boast and brag. All such boasting is evil. Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it since. We can be prideful thinking we know what's going to happen in the future because we carefully plan everything. And I'm a planner. But guess what? <laughs> Plans don't always go the way they're supposed to. Uh, we can get so boastful even in what we think is going to be happening in the future and so caught up in it that we can ignore the good that we ought to be doing while we're boasting about how we've got it together. And, um, and again, we need to be careful. Pride comes in in a variety of forms. Looks like first, uh, first nine verses, Nebuchadnezzar calls for the wise men to give insight to his dream. And yeah, this is the, uh, the second dream of, of Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 1, King Nebuchadnezzar to the peoples, nations, men of every language who live in all the world, may you prosper greatly. It is my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders, his kingdom is an eternal kingdom, his dominion endures, endures from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home in my palace, contented and prosperous. I had a dream that made me afraid. As I was lying in my bed, the images and visions that passed through my mind terrified me. So I commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be brought before me to interpret the dream for me. When the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners came, I told them the dream, but they could not interpret it for me. Finally, Daniel came into my presence, and I told him the dream. He is called Belshazzar, after the name of my God, and the spirit of the holy gods is in him. I said... Belshazzar, chief of the magicians, I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you and no mystery is too difficult for you. Here is my dream and interpret it for me. First, we say Nebuchadnezzar lacks the insight to uh, acknowledge God. Uh, willing to extol the God of Daniel and again, uh, but still walking in his own palace and talking about how contented he was, how prosperous uh, he was again uh, by his, uh, his own hands. And 
And uh, kind of keep in mind, uh, I don't know if you saw the movie uh, A Night with the King, the, the story of Esther. We showed some film clips when we were going through Esther. But, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's pretty Hollywoodish, but it gives you a sense of the dynamic uh, and the greatness of that Persian kingdom. Uh, again, the Greek historians writing uh, in that day, shortly after Nebuchadnezzar, of course, you've heard them uh, the reference to Babylon being one of the, the hanging gardens there, one of the uh, ancient wonders of, uh, of, of the world there. Uh, one of uh, Nebuchadnezzar's uh, wives uh, missed the mountains and the forest and the waterfalls and so forth, so he just recreated it several hundred feet uh, up in the air. To this day, they don't know how they got the water up and down, what type of a pumping system. There's archaeological evidence for it. There's the historical documents uh, by Greek uh, historians and so forth. But what they pulled off was pretty amazing. Uh, you, you can understand why he would stand uh, on the rooftop of his palatial mansion there with uh, waterfalls going in the middle of the desert you know, but again, using the water of the Euphrates coming right through the city and being very proud uh, about it all. And uh, this is, again, after the fact that uh, uh, he has, uh, you know, uh, seen what took place in terms of Daniel's life and Daniel interpreting the dream. And, you know, Daniel says, you're the head of gold and all these predictions. And, man, he's extolling Daniel's God, you know, after that. Then you've got the, what we went through last week, the fiery furnace, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And then he sees, Nebuchadnezzar sees one like a sons uh, of the gods in there. Again, you know, anybody that talks bad about the God of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we're going to kill them and tear their house down and all these <laughs> horrible things, you know, and, uh, uh, and, and so forth. Uh, as we mentioned there, though, uh, that doesn't mean that he is humbled, he's repented, and he's turned away from all of the other gods, the many that they worship. That really hasn't happened. Uh, again, it's possible to, for people to kind of give lip service or intellectual uh, understanding to the God of the Bible and Jesus and who he is, but never have really bowed their knee to him, never really humbled themselves and repented uh, of, of their uh, their sins, and this dream comes to him, and it brings fears to him uh, at this point. Uh, secondly, the wise men lack the insight to interpret the dream. Now, this is interesting because back in chapter 2, you recall, uh, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, and he says, um, he calls all, the, all of his wise men in, you know, the Harry Potter gang, they all come in, uh, and he says, I want you to tell me the dream, uh, and then interpret it for me. And they're like, well, we can't do that. No king has ever asked such a thing. You tell us the dream and then we'll interpret it, right? I mean, that's, that was their, their line. And here he's telling them the dream and they still can't interpret it. Uh, and uh, it says, finally, Daniel came into my presence and I told him the dream. He is called Belshazzar after the name of my God and the spirit of the holy gods is, uh, is in him. And remember, he, this is a reference that he names Daniel, takes Daniel's name, his Hebrew name, and of Daniel and, uh, and turns it into uh, the name of one of the gods, the chief gods there. Uh, again, this all brings us to the point to realize that even though Nebuchadnezzar has so given lip service and, quote, extolled the gods of Daniel and, the he and so forth, he's still clinging to uh, the gods of his old, old life. And uh, he's not going to be set free from those things until he really forsakes them and repents from them and and really humbles themselves uh, to the living God. And there's a lot of people uh, in that condition, uh, probably uh, especially in, uh, in our, our culture today. But Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. There's a lot of people saying, Lord, Lord, about Jesus, but uh, they haven't entered in. And there's a lot of people that just kind of have that, that mentality, you know, of, of throwing, you know, hey, God bless you. And I was on the phone. I don't know if you had that experience lately, but if you call an airline, you talk to somebody in India. It's an amazing thing. I mean, I, I swear I'm, I'm talking to a 19-year-old in India who's handling my reservations, and it doesn't, you know, exude confidence with me when I'm trying to make a change. And, uh, and I... Other than that, I love talking to people in India. I like the accent and everything. But, you know, when it's flights and prices, you kind of want to make sure we're, we're on the same level here, you know, and stuff. 
And, uh, and I was talking to this one gal and telling her I was going to need to uh, uh, make a change and, and, uh, because uh, we're going up to see Josh. And now he's got his, uh, his uh, heart procedure has been rescheduled for September 6th. So we're going to change this reservation because we're going to come back on the 4th. So we're going to extend it. I kind of explained this, hoping to get a price break, of course. <laughs> And I uh, made it sound really, well, it is serious, but uh, I explained the situation to her, and sometimes airlines will kind of waive some of the penalties. Uh, she got done, and she said, well, uh, I'll certainly be praying, you know, for your son, and may God bless you. You know, it's like, that was very nice of her to say. Uh, my only question was, which God would that be exactly? You know, there's several thousand in India, you know. But uh, Nebuchadnezzar, you know, he's still very prideful. Uh, an indication that, uh, uh, and we'd kind of look at it and go, wow, no wonder. I mean, if you had what he had, did what he did. But at the same time, uh, God's still dealing with him. He calls for the wise men to give insight. They have none, so he informs Daniel concerning the dream. And we see that in verse 10 to 18. These are the visions I saw while lying in my bed. I looked, and there before me stood a tree in the middle of the land. Its height was enormous. The tree grew, grew large and strong and touched the sky. It was visible to the ends of the earth, its leaves were beautiful, its fruit abundant, and on it was food for all. Under it, the beasts of the field found shelter, and the birds of the air lived in its branches. From it, every creature was fed. In the vision I saw while I was laying in my bed, I looked, and there before me was a messenger, a holy one, coming down from heaven. He called in a loud voice, cut down the tree and trim off its branches." Strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the animals flee from under it and the birds from its branches. But let the stump and its roots bound with iron and bronze remain in the ground in the grass of the field. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let him live with the animals among the plants of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man and let him be given the mind of an animal till seven times pass by for him. The decision is announced by messengers. The holy ones declare the verdict so that the living may know that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes and sets over them the lowliest of men. That is the dream that I, King Nebuchadnezzar, had. Now, Belteshazzar, tell me what it means, for none of the wise men in my kingdom can interpret it for me, but you can because the spirit of the holy gods uh, is in you. Uh, again, still recognizing there's something special about Daniel, but again, holy gods as in plural, small g. Uh, Daniel's informed of, of the vision. Again, the, the tree that stands in the middle of the land, large and beautiful, fills the land. Uh, it's the boast of, uh, of Nebuchadnezzar in reality, in history. Nebuchadnezzar claimed, uh, and to a degree did, provide for everybody. He boasted in his ability to provide uh, income and food and so forth, uh, and that the people of his kingdom basically lived a good life. This was his boast historically, uh, and certainly we see that uh, uh, here in the dream. Uh, Daniel's informed, uh, secondly, about the messenger. Verse 13, in the vision I saw while lying in my bed, I looked, and therefore uh, before me was a messenger, a holy one coming down from heaven, and the message was that the tree is going to be cut down. But there's the idea that the stump remained, the roots remained, iron and bronze clad over it. And, uh, and again, God is going to cut down Nebuchadnezzar, but there's still hope. Uh, he's not absolutely uh, destroyed. And um, I don't know if you've experienced this. <laughs> God still works this way. <laughs> he still takes prideful people that he's trying to reach and he cuts them down. Uh, but no, he doesn't destroy them. But he'll, he'll, he'll knock us down a few notches to try to get our uh, attention. Now, it's interesting, in the ancient Babylonian records, uh, which we have quite a few, uh, uh, there's a story of a Babylonian king whose name is spelled the same way as Nebuchadnezzar, but pronounced differently. The story in the ancient Babylonian records of this king, uh, and then he ends with, he acknowledges that God is able to humble the proud. And man, he was, he was, pretty, he was pretty prideful. Uh, and that's the lesson here for us. Again, we go all the way back to uh, Daniel being introduced to Nebuchadnezzar. And in some ways, Daniel and his buddies being exalted, being faithful to God and so forth as a witness uh, for God, uh, end with the most powerful ruler on the face of the planet at the time finally being humbled and coming to faith uh, uh, in, in God. 
uh, I read a little uh, article from a book in, entitled Why, Why Sin Matters uh, by Mark Mc, McMinn that says, when we see ourselves as pretty good, we misunderstand the gravity of sin and our desperate need for grace. We place ourselves above others, ju- uh, become their judges, and give them power to disappoint us. A uh, physicist friend uses this analogy. Each, is of, uh, each of us is like a light bulb. One shines with 50 watts of holiness, another with 25 watts. Maybe the most stellar Christians are 200 watts. But these comparisons become trite in the presence of the sun. In the face of God, our different levels of piety are puny and meaningless. It makes no sense to compare ourselves with one another because we are all so much Excuse me, because we are all much more alike than we are different. Uh, though we're pretty good, I'm okay. I'm okay, you're okay, is, is not what the Bible says. Uh, the Bible says that man's heart is deceitfully wicked, and who can know it? And uh, man, our only hope is, is Jesus Christ. They come in and really, uh, by his goodness, show us that. But that's not going to make me feel better. No, yeah, but it'll save your soul from hell and give you a place in heaven and a relationship uh, with a living God. Then, then you can really feel, <laughs> feel good about yourself. But, but it's to God be the glory, great things uh, he, he has done. And uh, the world right now is, is kind of flip-flop on this whole thing where we really extol uh, guys that are, that, are, that are prideful. And, uh, and at the same time, we, uh, in a sense, we... Uh, we don't even appreciate sometimes uh, people with, with real humility. But uh, which person do you want to live in the same house with? <laughs> which one do you want for a, a neighbor? Man, it's the, it's the humble person. It's, it's the lowly person. Uh, the one that uh, looks to God gives God the glory. It's not the one that exudes this, you know, look at me. Uh, I am special. I am special. Look at me. Look at me. That's not where we want to go, certainly go with our kids. Uh, and that's not what we want to see in our own lives. It's deceptive. It's uh, in our culture. Uh, God opposes it, but he gives grace to the humble. Let's learn the lesson of Nebuchadnezzar.